for today's um, conversation, we will have a presentation by Professor Keel, and then he will be in dialogue with um, Teresa Montoya. I will introduce them both, and afterwards there will be time for a Q&A portion. So if you'd like to join the conversation, uh, please just write your name in the chat and we will call on um, folks in order during that time. So just write your name and stack up in the chat that you have a question. Um, you don't necessarily have to write it out. You can unmute then when you, when you are able to speak. So, all right, um, really excited to get started. First, let me introduce um, Teresa Montoya who will be moderating and in dialogue with Professor Keel today. Teresa Montoya is a Provost Postdoctoral Fellow and incoming Assistant Professor of Anthropology at the University of Chicago. Her research and media production focuses on the legacies of settler colonial violence in the indigenous Southwest in relation to contemporary challenges around tribal jurisdiction, regulatory politics, and water security. In particular, her work engages ongoing impacts of uranium and hard rock mining disasters for Diné communities across the Navajo Nation. Her research has been published in venues such as Cultural Anthropology, Water International, the American Journal of Public Health, and the Journal for the Anthropology of North America. As a mode of public engagement, her pho photographic and film work has been shown internationally, most recently in an exhibition entitled Spill in Vancouver, British Columbia. In addition to her art practice, she has a curatorial and education experience in various institutions, including the Peabody Essex Museum, the National Museum of the American Indian, and currently the Field Museum in Chicago, where she is collaborating with indigenous artists on an exhibition titled Native Truths, Our Voices, Our Stories, set to open in May of this year. She is Danae and an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation. But first we'll turn to Professor Doug Keel, who I am so excited um, to have here in Chicago. We're just really thrilled that you would come and share with us today. Uh, Professor Keel is a citizen of the Oneida Nation and studies Native American history with a particular interest in the region now known as the American Midwest. Keel is finishing a book entitled Unsettling Territory, Oneida Nation Resurgence and Anti-Sovereignty Backlash. Their book examines how Oneida leaders realized a dramatic reversal of fortune over the 20th century by recovering ownership of tens of thousands of acres of reservation land and sparking a decade of litigation with neighboring Wisconsin municipalities. In 2019, Keel testified as an expert witness in Oneida Nation versus Village of Hobart, a legal victory upholding the ongoing presence of the reservation's boundaries. Prior to joining the Northwestern faculty, Professor Keel taught at Williams College, Columbia University, the University of Pennsylvania, and Middlebury College. They are a recipient of grants and fellowships from the Ford Foundation, the Institute for, the Citizen, for Citizens and Scholars, the Lyndon Baines Johnson Foundation, the American Philosophical Society, the Newberry Library, and the School of Advanced Research in Santa Fe, New Mexico, among others. Keel currently serves on the Illinois Holocaust and Genocide Commission and as an advisor and co-curator at the Field Museum, whose now permanent exhibit, Native Truths, Our Voices, Our Stories, just mentioned, opens on May 20th. So I'm also looking forward to that um, exhibit when it comes. So without further ado, uh, we'll turn it over to Professor Keel and Teresa Montoya. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for everyone who organized and brought this event together. I'm really uh, happy to join this community in conversation, uh, as I understand it, uh, in so many ways, getting a, a dialogue started uh, about uh, uh, processes of uh, uh, land acknowledgments. Uh, I'll pull up a, uh, uh, my screen to share. So the way that I'm going to approach uh, organizing uh, today's dialogue, because um, I'm going to be trying to put a lot on the table, um, a, a lot for us to potentially discuss. Uh, it looks like we actually have colleagues uh, from the Field Museum, other colleagues from Northwestern uh, who are around who maybe don't necessarily want to uh, jump in. But that's to say that uh, there's folks around from other institutions um, uh, you know, for us to have a, you know, a, uh, an exchange back and forth uh, you know, as we go on. Um, and I'm going to, uh, to get us started, uh, divide things into, into three parts. Uh, first, dealing with basic questions of where are we uh, as, as uh, serving as the foundation of uh, land acknowledgement work. Um, second, to look at uh, uh, questions of uh, what happens when we actually are successful in reestablishing presence. Um, and uh, uh, to make that point, I'm going to draw uh, a bit from uh, my own work uh, on the Oneida Nation and land recovery, uh, but also uh, uh, keeping it local uh, to things that are happening uh, 
uh, locally at, uh, uh, at Northwestern. Uh, and which is to say, uh, uh, shifting from there, part three uh, will be about um, uh, these local institutional transformations. Uh, just giving a sense of, of the, the origins and uh, structure of uh, Northwestern's indigenous initiatives. Um, and to tell you a little bit about things that are also happening at the Field Museum, uh, though I certainly don't represent that place, uh, but to share um, you know, a, a few uh, exciting previews into uh, the new coming uh, permanent exhibit uh, opening May 20th, uh, Native Truths. Uh, so, part one, where are we? Well, in so many ways, we can open up this question to indigenous versus Euro-American conceptions of, of, of place and geography, right? So one answer to that question, to that basic question of where, where are we? Well, it's Turtle Island. Uh, Turtle Island, uh, we can, we can conce uh, conceptualize this in a variety of ways, uh, pointing to origin stories uh, 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 such as uh, that of my own nation, uh, uh, the Oneida people who are part of a broader Haudenosaunee or Iroquois Confederacy. Uh, our story includes that of Sky Woman, uh, who, uh, who uh, falls to the earth and lands on, on, on the turtle's back, um, and that becomes the basis for uh, the creation story. Um, and I, I, I point to this particular image uh, as a way of us understanding, in addition to it being a story, um, and a lot comes with that story, um, you know, different communities uh, draw uh, a different meaning from, uh, from different variations of the story. Um, our relationship with the three sisters, uh, corn, beans, and squash, for instance, and, uh, and, and other plants are all rooted in that story. Um, but also, North America is a turtle, right, as we can see uh, from looking at this image on the map, right, which uh, uh, to that point, right, to draw attention to indigenous knowledge, right, uh, to draw attention to, uh, you know, indigenous understandings of, uh, of our own place in the world, right. Uh, and, and so as we take a moment to, to think about Turtle Island as a concept that is one of, of, of story, uh, but is also in, uh, in, in, in a basic sense, uh, an indigenous understanding of a map, right. Another map I want to open with, uh, and this is uh, similarly in the service of trying to uh, complicate and trouble our, our conceptions of, of place. Uh, and uh, one way in which I use this map, uh, typically uh, at the outset of, um, uh, of my uh, courses in federal Indian law and policy, um, is this particular map uh, shows uh, Indian reservations throughout the United States uh, as basically little holes, uh, or in the case of uh, nations like uh, Navajo Nation, uh, not so little holes um, in uh, uh, in U.S. states, right? So chunks of uh, of U.S. sovereignty, uh, you know, that are that are not entirely whole, um, you know, uh, uh, in that regard, right? So a different way of understanding and looking at the United States, right? Other ways in which we can conceptualize the where we are question. We can draw from the important texts uh, and testimonies of uh, leaders of uh, Native communities in the 19th century. Um, uh, I, I point in particular to the, to the powerful works written, oh, I have them, uh, they should be left, right, uh, uh, reversed, I suppose, um, uh, Black Hawk uh, coming first and um, uh, his, his autobiography uh, following in the wake of uh, the so-called Black Hawk War. Uh, of, uh, of the 1830s. Um, and uh, we also have uh, a picture here of Simon Pokagan, uh, who if you're not familiar with Simon Pokagan, he is uh, 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 the namesake of the Pokagan band, or actually his grandfather is. Um, and he writes a, uh, a, a book that is uh, initially titled uh, The Red Man's Rebuke, uh, uh, that is later uh, retitled to the Red Man's Greeting, a little bit more softer and inviting uh, uh, title. Um, and this is a book that is printed on bir birch bark and sold in large volume at the World's Fair in 1893. And the significance of each of these two texts, you know, one is we, we have an understanding of military conquest from the point of view of Black Hawk, who is uh, if anything, a military uh, leader uh, of his people, right? And he is writing uh, his autobiography, his his account while in captivity, right? Uh, even dedicates it to his uh, captor, you know, which raises interesting questions about its context and purpose. Um, but it offers a really important set of insights into uh, uh, military conquest in, in 19th century Illinois. And what Simon Polkagan does uh, alternatively 
uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, 1893, World's Fair, right? This is the Columbian Exposition. So uh, this is all about overtly celebrating Columbus, right? Uh, and, and celebrating everything that he represents. Uh, and Simon Pokagan's uh, contribution at the World's Fair is to, uh, uh, is to prepare this publication and, and to uh, deliver it in, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, in, uh, in speech form uh, to large crowds. Uh, and effectively, Simon Pokagan's text, uh, again called The Red Man's Rebuke or The Red Man's Greeting, uh, in so many ways, not to be too crass about it, but is a middle finger to the World's Fair. Um, the entire premise of it, right? It calls into question uh, the entire notion of this grand celebration in which Chicago sees itself as the center of the world in this great 19th century industrial city that uh, that arose uh, uh, seemingly out of the middle of nowhere, right? Uh, 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 so much according to its own kind of narrative about itself, right? And so as we ask these questions of where are we? You know, important sources that we can turn to, right? For, for answering those questions, we have these, you know, historical texts, but also uh, the communities, of course, that, uh, uh, you know, that, that descend from uh, from these leaders uh, who remain present today, including uh, the Pokagon Band uh, uh, just around the bend in Michigan. And as we think about the reality of such histories, by contrast, I want us to be conscious of, I, I made this as big as possible, the Blackhawk image, uh, for it to be as jarring as possible, you know, for it to be as uh, uncomfortable as possible, right? Uh, which is to say, and I've only mentioned just, you know, a very brief uh, bit about it, right? Uh, but this is someone whose story we have, right? Blackhawk's autobiography, powerful testimony written uh, while in captivity, right? And decades later, the way to commemorate him becomes the establishment of a hockey team. Uh, whose imagery remains uh, an ongoing problem in a variety of ways. Also, as we think of the where we are question, I want to point to uh, uh, just a couple of instances of, of public art uh, to, uh, to, to get the ball rolling uh, uh, with those conversations. Uh, here we have uh, the, uh, reliefs that are visible downtown. Uh, you've maybe seen them. They're on the Michigan Avenue Bridge. Uh, literally millions of people walk by them right, every year. Uh, most wouldn't necessarily take uh, take notice of what's being uh, depicted here. Uh, and what's being depicted is uh, the Battle of Fort Dearborn, uh, which is uh, not a good day for the settler population. And engraved, uh, the plaque on the monument reads, Defense. Fort De Dearborn stood almost on the spot after an heroic defense in 1812. The garrison, together with women and children, was forced to evacuate the fort. Led by Captain Wells, they were brutally massacred by the Indians. They will be cherished as martyrs in our early history. And so there is a narrative, uh, quite you know, uh, intently of martyrdom, right? As uh, as uh, establishing the basis uh, of uh, uh, of uh, European American claims to Chicago, right? And this is, you know, of course, situated as a founding event in, in a variety of ways. Uh, for those of us who are uh, longtime Chicagoans, uh, maybe have a familiarity with the uh, flag of Chicago uh, uh, and the stars on that flag. Uh, uh, the, the battle at uh, uh, Fort Dearborn is the first of those uh, uh, stars. The world's uh, Columbian Exposition is uh, actually one of them as well. And this event in history has been commemorated in other form as well. Uh, this is a version of that same event uh, that previously was on public display uh, as a monument, um, in which we can see in, in, uh, in the bottom right, a small child uh, uh, reaching for, uh, for dear life, right? Uh, in what is a, a, a really uh, a brutal attack. Thinking about public art and representation, just a couple more to put on, uh, on, on the table. Uh, for us to potentially talk about. Um, uh, this is uh, the Bowman and, and the Spearman. Um, uh, uh, these, are, these are two pieces uh, downtown Grant Park. Uh, these have, have come up for uh, as part of conversations, uh, as, as part of uh, monuments in Chicago and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, larger questions of social justice uh, uh, relating to them. So that's just to say, putting Simon Pokagan and Blackhawk and, and his autobiography in contrast with all of these inauthentic uh, and, uh, and 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 in many ways offensive uh, uh, representations that are about right. So that image of uh, a Blackhawk uh, in in the form of the NH NHL logo, right, uh, is perhaps the uh, the most, or maybe not perhaps, is, is certainly is uh, the most visible uh, uh, 
imagery of a you know, quote unquote, full Indian uh, sense uh, that is visible, right? So representations of native people, right? Uh, that NHL logo uh, is, is perhaps most visible of all. About these questions of reestablishing presence. Um, this is uh, a set of questions that pertains to my own work. We're gonna quick detour to Wisconsin, uh, uh, talk about what I, uh, uh, some of the work that I do. And the United Nation has, uh, uh, or had uh, come into um, uh, legal disputes over uh, the, uh, the uh, of whether the boundaries of the reservation remain intact. And this was a dispute that was prompted by uh, the mass repurchase of reservation lands. So what you see outlined here uh, is the Oneida Nations uh, Reservation uh, established in 1838, 65,000 acres. And by about 1920, because of the policy of allotment, um, uh, these 65,000 uh, acres, uh, only about, I'd say 2,000 at maximum of those acres remained in the ownership of Oneida people. Uh, and as far as Hamovich had actually remained formally in the ownership of, uh, of the tribe itself, his land held in trust, uh, those lands may have gotten as low as 90 acres, uh, you know, um, uh, by, uh, by the 1920s because of allotment. And over the course of the 20th century, the Oneida Nation has recovered vast stretches of, uh, of this land and has done so uh, initially quite gradually. Um, with uh, uh, legislative changes that come in the 1930s uh, through what's called the Indian New Deal. Uh, and those changes create new possibilities for the repurchase of lands that have been lost uh, through a lot. And so initially it's a few thousand acres. Right? Um, it's important, uh, but, you know, uh, but certainly it's not uh, really changing the map. And uh, by the 1970s, the pace of this land recovery uh, begins to pick up pace, uh, but still uh, isn't really all that much. Um, and as we reflect on uh, the scale of land loss, a couple uh, of maps to, uh, uh, to indicate that. And recovery, again, begins in the 1930s. By the 1970s, it's a little bit more uh, uh, you know, persistent, but still rather slow. Um, but after the uh, advent of a tribal casino, again, uh, following certain changes in federal Indian law and policy, um, suddenly there's a new influx of economic resources into the community, a massive proportion of which goes to uh, buying back land uh, of that 65,000 acres that had been lost through allotment. And through the 1990s and into the early 2000s, uh, the United Nation recovers tens of thousands of acres uh, of this land. And it begins to agitate what are really complicated local political relationships. In the time after allotment, uh, you know, we saw this you know, a simple map of the Oneida Reservation uh, uh, earlier, right? But now you see what is uh, the political reality after allotment, which is uh, the reservation is split into two Wisconsin counties uh, and numerous uh, 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 individual municipalities also have uh, 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 overlap into the reservation. Uh, as you can see in the uh, upper right, uh, the city of Green Bay, uh, the, uh, the portion shaded in purple. Um, 13% of the city of Green Bay is inside the Oneida Reservation, right? And so that's to say uh, that that little chunk of purple uh, that the Oneida Nation will persistently over the course of this century uh, will uh, recover you know, probably uh, the vast majority of it. Um, all of that land can be repurchased by the Oneida Nation um, and taken out of the city of Green Bay's municipal tax base. Um, and where this has uh, been particularly uh, 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 a contentious issue is in the, in, in the area shaded in green, uh, which is the village of, of Hobart in Brown County. The village of Hobart, uh, uh, which is actually created by Oneida people uh, as an interesting mechanism after allotment, uh, the, the Oneida Nation creates uh, two municipalities inside the reservation, the town of Oneida, and the town of Hobart. Um, and these towns are a mechanism for accessing funds for the development of roads in the reservation, state funds. And Oneidas initially govern uh, those local municipalities, but after the effects of allotment, uh, the Oneida Nation loses local uh, uh, governance and jurisdiction to what is increasingly a non-native majority, right? And so effectively what the Oneida Nation is, is, is doing is uh, engaging in a process that is undoing allotment. And the idea of undoing allotment means that all of that land pictured in green and uh, in area number two shaded on the map uh, is land that the Oneida Nation is actively buying back and taking out of the village of Hobart's tax base uh, from which it can sustain itself. And so what happens uh, is a really uh, tense uh, 
uh, dispute over uh, the, over the future of this area in the northern area of Hobart, um, increasingly uh, uh, developing and uh, uh, becoming uh, much more of a suburban uh, community of Green Bay uh, in an effort to drive up property prices uh, to make those properties difficult to purchase. So long, complicated uh, explanations, but I want to get to the real point, which is the story of recovery, as you can see here on this map. And so what's pictured in red and orange are lands that are in some form in the ownership of the Oneida Nation, right? In contrast with, with what you saw before, barely maybe 2,000, this is actually uh, 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 constituting about 40,000 acres of, of the reservation uh, at this point, or about 35,000 acres of the reservation uh, at this point. This, this map is a little bit outdated uh, from 2018, um, but you get a sense, the, the, the transition from that first map, right, showing very little Oneida ownership of land to the transition to this map, right? What underlies that is a really intense set of local disputes, legal disputes uh, about local transformations of power and really up, in, upending the imagined uh, 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 social order of things in that particular corner of Green Bay. And so this is to say, to point to 80 years after uh, the Oneida Nation began recovering lands, uh, realizing our dreams had incredible and unexpected consequences, which was the opening of an entirely new uh, set of legal disputes to try to stop us from being able to recover. And that argument I recently saw play out in uncomfortable ways, deeply uncomfortable ways, uh, rather close uh, to our community. So shifting to thinking about um, local institutions, uh, I'll, I'll talk about Northwestern more in a moment, but for now I'll just highlight that these are images from a recent canoe launch um, that was organized by the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research. We had a traditional Ojibwe canoe maker, Wayne Bellier, on campus uh, 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 for three weeks building a canoe. All the community was involved. We had all kinds of people there. It was great community event. I wound up on the front page of the Chicago Tribune. Uh, lots of people were there. It was a really joyful and uh, celebratory event, right? Uh, 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 for all the reasons that you might imagine. It's been a long, long time since uh, a traditional canoe like this has been launched in Lake Michigan. And so it was a beautiful, beautiful event to see that. And to set this up for context, you know, in the, in the weeks prior to this event, one would have seen uh, all kinds of uh, recognitions of, uh, you know, of this event uh, on, on the local websites and all these kinds of things. Uh, 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 and um, pointing to uh, the presence of an Ojibwe canoe maker. Very shortly after those uh, 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 that gathering uh, to launch the canoe, we had a perfectly nice gathering. Or, or, you know, the students had a perfectly nice gathering in which they uh, came together. And this is uh, traditionally what happens at Northwestern, these kinds of paintings of, of the rock area in the center of campus. Uh, in this one, you see a mix of uh, uh, what is uh, the art that the Native students made uh, in, in recognition of Native American Heritage Month, some of which remains visible, uh, and then much of which has been uh, scratched out and altered, right? And so that's to say, after several weeks of uh, promoting uh, these Ojibwe events on campus, so you can't uh, actually see one of the other modifications uh, uh, to this uh, language, which uh, identified the various communities um, whose homelands were on, uh, and, and uh, uh, the vandals rewrote it to say Ojibwe, question mark, no way, exclamation point, um, which uh, couldn't read anymore as an explicit rejection of, uh, uh, you know, enough of this, uh, 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 stuff about needing to care about Ojibwe things happening on our campus, uh, somebody deciding that they were just fed up with it. Um, so simple, basic reminders, right? And this is me, you know, transitioning to the questions about land acknowledgements. In so many ways, this moment for me was an important lesson about land acknowledgements because they seem so frustratingly simple, right? All you're asking people to do is acknowledge that history happened, right? It is the lowest possible bar. It's right there next to saying that Columbus was bad, right? Uh, as opposed to overtly celebrating him. Um, so this is really, really simple stuff. It seems, right? But it's not actually that simple. And we have students who wanna simply write a message that says, uh, uh, bring our children home in, in, uh, in reference to the remains of children uh, uh, at boarding schools. Um, they're saying, uh, happy Native American Heritage Month. Uh, no more stolen sisters in regards to violence against murdered and missing emerging indigenous women, right? Um, and so reestablishing presence locally on our campus, uh, uh, you know, uh, really provided a case study for there would be this uh, sort of, uh, you know, to be perfectly honest, a, a sense of delusion that of course a campus like Northwestern wouldn't have any kind of anti-indigenous problem. 
well, not if there's not visible indigenous people, uh, you're not going to, uh, uh, you're not necessarily going to see that problem, right? Uh, uh, the moment we, come, we become highly visible, right? Uh, we, we can see these kinds of responses. And it's a version of what happens, uh, again, at Oneida Nation. But we also came together and responded uh, 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 as community, had a round dance, and uh, in so many ways, uh, it brought the community even closer together, those challenges. So to recognize that too. And shifting to local in institutional transformations, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to be very quick, um, and I'll just map out uh, here, and we can talk about this more, um, the structure of Northwestern's Indigenous initiatives. Um, and, and the context for uh, Northwestern's Indigenous initiatives, if you're not familiar, um, is because the founder, John Evans, uh, was a central figure in, uh, in, in laying the groundwork for the awful events that led to the Sand Creek Massacre of 1864. Um, John Evans, uh, you know, for, for folks in, uh, in Colorado, was well remembered uh, as, as being particularly responsible uh, for those events. Uh, and he's the founder of Northwestern. And so uh, I think it was about 2013, students uh, began uh, uh, raising, uh, uh, you know, a protest uh, about we need to, you know, have more education about this on campus and think about what to do about it. Uh, that led to uh, what is you know, a series of acronyms now, uh, Native American Outreach and Inclusion Task Force, which was effectively the, the first group to really come together. So what do we do now with, uh, with this John Evans burden, right? And this Sand Creek Massacre uh, a burden that the institution carries, right? Uh, and so it's that Outreach and Inclusion Task Force, which is really the first entity um, that came together to start figuring out what does a university do to respond to these kinds of things? And we can you know, dialogue more um, about that. Um, and moving forward, uh, the Native American and Indigenous People Steering Group uh, continues to have the same kind of function, but in an ongoing way, right? Uh, so it's a permanent ongoing advisory uh, kind of group. Um, and uh, uh, the center of uh, our initiatives thus far have really focused on the creation of a research center, uh, uh, which is one of the things that uh, the task of, uh, Outreach and Inclusion Task Force uh, called for. Um, and so uh, uh, the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research is largely a center that uh, uh, promotes the, uh, the, uh, 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 the development of ethical research uh, that is community engaged. Um, and, uh, uh, and we do so interdisciplinarily. Um, and to quickly uh, shift to uh, pointing about uh, other institutional transformations that are happening that might be of relevance as we uh, have dialogue about uh, UChicago, uh, the Field Museum. I'll share a few previews uh, from the exciting stuff happening at the Field Museum. Uh, and I stole these slides courtesy of Alika Wally, my dear friend at the museum. So Native Truths uh, will be opening in May and just wanted to provide a, a little bit of a glimpse uh, into uh, some of its uh, early uh, uh, stages of development, uh, which include a, a floor that is made of Menominee timber, which is just absolutely gorgeous that has gone in. Um, you can see uh, some of the murals that have, uh, that have gone in, uh, some of the some of the large in images that are going to be anchoring it. It's not an especially big space, but the way that we've organized organized it, uh, and uh, uh, Teresa uh, is of course involved in uh, one of these stories. We've we have four permanent store our uh, rotating stories, um, and five uh, what we refer to as native truths. And as I close, uh, thinking about the Chicago section of, of the Field Museum's exhibition and its uh, uh, relevance, of course, to uh, uh, thinking about land acknowledgments for the University of Chicago. An important narrative that we came uh, came to after uh, 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 much discussion back and forth and including with community about how to approach the, uh, 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 the exhibition of uh, Chicago story in the Field Museum uh, and primarily came down to, uh, to a framework of understanding Chicago as a gathering place. Um, it's not such an easy place to try to do a land acknowledgement for, uh, in the sense of there's just a uh, one or two uh, uh, communities where uh, it, it becomes pretty easy to you know uh, uh, to pin down exactly whose homeland this is. It's home to a lot of people over a lot of different periods of time. Uh, this area around the southern bend of Lake Michigan is a is a place that people are passing around and through uh, for uh, for millennia, um, and so we emphasize it as that's what Chicago always is and always has been is a gathering place, right? And gathering place. Uh, can mean even uh, throwing together an, an impromptu powwow uh, uh, here in the urban community of Chicago. Uh, it can mean things uh, like the uh, canoe club uh, uh, gathering to uh, you know, uh, 
uh, uh, for Native people to get together and, and, and canoe up and down uh, the Chicago River. Uh, Chicago as, as gathering place uh, has really uh, emerged as an important and central theme. Um, and as I understand, uh, uh, early conversations about uh, the, the Block Museum at Northwestern uh, is pursuing the development of an exhibition that is all about indigenous art of Chicago. I think they're also kind of going with this kind of Chicago as crossroads uh, uh, sort of framework. I'll leave it at that so we can dialogue from there. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, let's see if we could take it out of your screen share mode. Thank you. Um, well, you've given us so much to think about. And um, just as a, a personal aside, I'm um, very grateful to have known you now for over a decade. I met Doug um, at the School for Advanced Research. I was an intern uh, many, many years ago. And I have to thank Doug for being part of my inspiration to even pursue a PhD in the first place. So in this public forum, I just want to say thank you and a for that guidance. And now gathered here virtually, you're continuing to offer guidance in this institutional context. Um, so I've been at UChicago now for um, almost three years um, as a postdoc. Um, of course, there was that COVID interruption. So in many ways, I'm still getting to know the institution. I'm getting to know um, Chicago as a place. Um, as a Diné woman, these are not my homelands. Um, and so I also want to tread lightly and respectfully of the indigenous people of this place. Um, and over the course of my time here, I've had um, many conversations with folks on campus who wanted to learn more about um, indigenous Chicago or what it would mean to do a land acknowledgement at the University of Chicago um, because we do not have one. Um, and with this question, I, I didn't want to just launch into um, an initiative without first having the information um, and the connections. Like, as we all know, like land acknowledgements can be very um, passive. They could be something that institutions use to pat themselves on the back, that they've just created this statement um, without um, coming up with any actionable items behind it. Um, so, this dialogue is part of that emerging conversation at the um, University of Chicago, which is to say there are other people um, from, from these broader um, homelands of the indigenous Midwest, um, people like yourself who have more institutional experience that could help us on that journey um, to decide what's the first step forward. So with that, I actually would love to hear more um, about that initial process at um, Northwestern, which I, I think started actually before you um, came to Northwestern. Um, but what did those initial conversations look like when people were coming together in the wake of this um, John Evans report? Yeah, it, it went through a variety of stages um, and I wasn't present for um, for the earliest portions of it you now, but I've uh, you know heard the stories from, from the students involved. Um, particularly in, in the earliest stages of the conversation, it was uh, apparently quite tense um, that the uh, administration was not especially uh, uh, supportive. I mean, it was a, a, a um, yeah, it was a rather contentious process uh, for the first few few years getting started. Um, I will say it's, it's actually been uh, surprising the uh, degree of uh, support we have seen uh, in, in in more recent years. Um, one important uh, piece of context, uh, you know, uh, in terms of where. Northwestern started, I mean, it couldn't have been more organically uh, uh, in a really perfect way, which is to say that uh, there's a, 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 a historian uh, you should know uh, by the name of John Lau, uh, who teaches at uh, the Ohio State uh, University at the Newark campus. Uh, John Lau was teaching in the history department. Uh, John Lau was Pokagon Band of Potawatomi. Uh, he's written a book called Imprints uh, uh, about Pokagon uh, history in, in Chicago, uh, Michigan University Press, check it out. Um, and I think in so many ways, you know, uh, you know, if, if I were to, uh, you know, to be honest, what I what I kind of regard as like, you know, uh, step one, it's like, well, uh, step one is being in touch with John Lyle, <laughs> uh, uh, in certain ways. Step one is being in touch with uh, uh, Pokagon Potawatomi people, right? And then of course that includes more than John Lyle, um, uh, 
uh, but you know, uh, as uh, as an important elder in the community, uh, certainly should be uh, one among many people uh, engaged with. Um, and so that was something that was actually just uh, out of uh, uh, you know a coincidence was already happening. Uh, uh, in that John Law was teaching on campus. He had been uh, executive director of the Mitchell Museum, uh, uh, the American Indian up in Evanston. Um, and so he was uh, mentoring uh, a lot of our native and non-native students uh, who were on campus and really uh, did a lot of work to get the ball rolling. And so uh, in so many ways, these recognitions, uh, it's important to uh, to note, right? Uh, this came from the push of a Potawatomi, uh, of a Pogeke Potawatomi person on campus, right? Um, you know, and... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, certainly been uh, a long road, um, but one thing I would note is uh, uh, what was really important uh, uh, in, in the beginning is uh, uh, to recognize the degree to which this has also really been student-centered. Uh, and I think this is fair to say about most things about ethnic studies programs and diversity inclusion and, and higher ed settings, uh, which is these things don't often get handed down uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, simply with generosity, right? There's often uh, a period of institutional conflict to be to be bridged, right? Uh, moments of clash, uh, you know, that uh, that often uh, precipitate the development of of new programs, right? Uh, at Northwestern Asian American Studies, for instance, you know, went through similar kinds of uh, growing pains, um, and so. It's important to recognize that students made a lot of this happen. Uh, students, undergrad students who were bothered by the fact that nobody was talking about who their founder was um, and simply wanted access to, to good indigenous studies. Uh, and within a few years, uh, uh, a few uh, you know, very vocal students, they changed the university. We now have uh, a lot of these programs. Like not, not only because of students, you know, much bigger community endeavor in a variety of ways, but um, uh, so let's just say, you know, I think, you know, one, Lesson to take that from the beginning uh, is uh, is to have local Pokagon Potawatomi guidance uh, early on, uh, uh, relationships uh, like that uh, early on, right? And uh, and I think in, input and energy uh, and investment uh, from students, particularly undergrads, I think is also uh, really vital for keeping the issue energized, right? Um, uh, you know, I often find, for instance, uh, that undergraduate students, you know, uh, you know uh, reaching into the present as well, uh, remain some of the most uh, engaged uh, uh, you know, uh, actors on campus in terms of who's really committed to seeing some of these uh, institutional transformations happen. Other undergrads, they'd like to see uh, their uh, student body change. Hope that gets at some of what you're asking. Yes, no, that's great. Um, and I'd like to hear a bit more also about the establishment of CNAIR itself. So as we know, um, both you and I have been lots of different institutional contexts and each one of those places has had its own growing pain, so to speak, with actually implementing and growing Native studies. It's not just um, about growing scholarship, but there's also you know, student support, uh, recruitment, um, admissions, um, and then also the physical space. Um, so what are, um, what, what has been, I guess, some of the, the lessons or um, early developments you could speak to? Because it's actually quite remarkable that CNR has grown as much as it has in this short period of time since, was it 2015 or 16 that it was a Yeah, we started in 2016. Yeah. I know what I mean. It, it, starting here depends on you know, a variety of different metrics. But um, in terms of the early conversations about what CNR uh, would look like, it's really uh, really interesting because, you know, CNR is actually quite unique. Um, uh, and, and it actually looks like there's other kinds of uh, research centers that are popping up in, in a similar kind of model um, in the sense that, so I think from the administration's point of view, and maybe still uh, to a certain degree, uh, the idea of what we were uh, uh, there to build, right, I think to them was Indigenous studies, right, build a Native American studies program. Uh, but what the Outreach and Inclusion Task Force was actually asking for was something bigger than that, actually much bigger than that. Um, they were really talking about writing the university's relationship with Native people, right? Not, not simply teaching courses that are about that, right? But actually uh, reorganizing how the university works in relation to actually serving Indigenous needs, right? And so when, you know, when a group of community members came together uh, to, uh, uh, to imagine what would uh, an ideal way forward look like for this institution, a research center uh, was it, right? And a research center can include space for uh, Native American and Indigenous studies, uh, but that's to say that a research center is one that also 
could reach into the medical school uh, to engage in, uh, in questions of you know, perhaps you know, uh, research of diabetes. It could reach into the law school in important ways. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we have a, a, a PhD student in environmental engineering who's doing amazing things with uh, Manoma and wild rice and little tiny robots and sensors, right? Um, conceptualizing that as, you know, as, as part of the intellectual work of, of indigenous studies, right? And so in so many ways, CNAIR is, uh, you know, I'd like to think of it as, you know, if, if, if we had our own university, right, what would it look like? What, what sort of ways would indigenous people pursue research? What sort of questions um, and, 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 and what sort of ways, right, reaching uh, outside and, and beyond uh, 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 traditional disciplinary frameworks, right? And so um, that's the kind of place that we came up with. And, and really the reason for that being, um, you know, that we wanted to try to stimulate work all across the university. Uh, rather than uh, developing uh, an Indigenous Studies program first, though that's still coming, um, you know, the idea uh, being to try to get the, the entire campus engaged, right? Um, so we're to build an Indigenous Studies program in the College of Arts and Sciences. That's great. But what about the medical school then, right? The medical school then has no engagement, no, no motive to connect with, uh, uh, with this center. And, you know, uh, and so we, from the very beginning, wanting to I you know, designed something that was meant to try to attract as many people into uh, the center as possible, right? Trying to uh, really become a hub for the, you know, any research across the university engaging with native populations. And, and in so many ways, um, our early conversations, you know, were about basically trying to find those overlaps, right? Um, and in certain ways it was tough because it was, I mean, what are we, the center for indigenous everything? This, you know, this, uh, you know, we can't necessarily go that, go that way. What is it really about? Um, in certain ways, um, we kind of landed on what is really kind of identifiable as, as an area studies approach, right? Uh, area studies, if you consider Native America to be the area, right, that, that's being studied. Um, and, and, and again, that's to say interdisciplinary work that, in, that it can include, you know, the entire spectrum of what universities do. Um, and so that's quite distinct from, you know, uh, you know I, I, you know, was in the grad school of the program in American Indian Studies at you know, Madison, uh, really great program, you know, uh, uh, a very different set of ideas uh, behind it. Um, and so, Real utility, community engagement, uh, you know, producing something really tangible. Uh, uh, I, I, th I think these were, you know, some of the core questions that were driving um, uh, uh, recommendations behind the research center that eventually became um, senior. Um, yeah, in many ways, like even though we're both at institutions in the the broader Chicago land region, you know our land acknowledgements would look very different than Northwestern's. Um, and I think this is also something that's difficult to get across. Um, you know, your, your project started with this, um, well, the recognition of um, John Evans' role in the Sand Creek Massacre in genocide. And I know that the, the other report that was put together by University of Denver, which is my alma mater from my master's program was much more damning. So even that looks very different. And they have, you know, John Evans um, who founded both universities, you know, each university looked at those actions very differently. Um, you know, in U Chicago, we have this whole um, history of um, the Chicago World's Fair, which is something that I, you know, teach my students, right? Like to be in relation and to like enter into the classroom is to you know not just acknowledge like where we are and what that history has been, but what its enduring presence means for us to occupy this space. Um, so moving forward, I um, I guess if you could just um, before we go into the larger uh, Q and A, um, how have you taken this model from Northwestern and maybe applied it to your partnerships with other institutions? This could be a space where you talk about the Field Museum or um, yeah, like what have those relationships been in the larger region and to what extent has that been helpful in leveraging something broader um, beyond Northwestern? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think it's one that is, you know, increasingly one filled, that's filled with lots of potential. Um, you know, suddenly there's there's more institutional players, it seems. You know, I've only been here a few years, and so I'm going on the basis of, you know, somebody who's studied the history of Chicago, um, you know, and whose family is from here, but, you know, I, I've not been. Um, but that's to say that, you know, Northwestern's new commitments uh, coming alongside 
um, uh, the Field Museum's new commitments, uh, which also, you know, I didn't, uh, you know, uh, uh, talk about things happening at the Art Institute, uh, but over there too, important transformative conversations uh, about the exhibition of, uh, of Native North America and, and really the, the classification of, of, of art history uh, writ large. Um, uh, and that was all prompted by you know, a potential exhibition that, that never happened. Um, as I mentioned before, the Block Museum uh, is currently developing an exhibition on indigenous art in Chicago. Local artists are developing uh, 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 a new institution called the Center for Native Futures. Um, uh, 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 the Shy Nations Youth Council, uh, uh, youth activists have developed a, an urban garden, right? Um, and so there's been you know, a, a really, uh, exciting flourish that's that's been happening uh, over the last few years, and the more that institutions, especially institutions with resources, um, uh, decide to uh, you know uh, participate, I think you know the better for all. And uh, and so that's to say that I, I think already um, you know uh, talking about John Lyle's presence, I mean certain relationships were already built in and certain kinds of overlaps, right? Uh, uh, that's to say that John himself uh, had relationships with people at the Field Museum and people at the Mitchell Museum, right? People at the Newberry <clears throat> already, right? And that there's already some some overlap. Uh, you know, I mentioned uh, Alec Wally from the Field Museum earlier, right? Who's also been an affiliate at Northwestern uh, for many years. And so, you know, there have been, you know, institutional overlaps, um, uh, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, as of late, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, making uh, bigger new commitments, I think it's, you know, a really exciting time to think about, you know, potentially larger collective um, uh, initiatives, right, or or ways of, you know, uh, you know of uh, uh, if not pooling resources, but you know, uh, uh, collaborating institutionally, you know, uh, across you know uh, common areas of interest. And so, um, it's been exciting over the last few years uh, seeing the ways in which uh, there's just a, a lot of exchange between institutions like the Field Museum and the Newberry Library, right? Um, and you know, Newberry Library right now is developing a whole new exhibition on a digital to Chicago. We could bring Rose Myron from the Newberry, maybe you already have, right? Uh, talk about all the work that, that's going on over there. Um, and, and so let's just say that all these institutions have always been in conversation, right? And, uh, and I think we've all been leaning on each other, listening to each other, right? Borrowing from one another, uh, looking at what one another are doing, right? When we're sitting around and uh, in the room having conversations, we're definitely peeking on the websites of, you know, other institutions and how are they approaching it? And, um, you know, and, um, it's, it's important to recognize Northwestern has always had this distinct uh, uh, kind of responsibility again with the John Evans uh, history, right? Uh, that it's about more than land acknowledgement, uh, that there's also this kind of, um, you know, a different constituency uh, that remains, uh, you know, a public that the university has to serve. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a set of dialogues that have often involved a, a lot of uh, exchange and overlap and, you know, uh, the more the better. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, I'm going to segue now to this broader conversation and see if there's a way that I can read all these questions. Um, some of these are very specific to you, Chicago. Um, so first I have a question um, from Josh who asks, how can or should religious groups, mosques, church, et cetera, engage local natives for cooperation or acknowledgements? I was muted. Uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, I think this is one instance in which it would be uh, important to understand uh, the utility of uh, Chicago's American Indian Center. Um, I, I think you know, uh, the AIC, uh, people also call the Art Institute that, but the real AIC, the American Indian Center. Um, uh, you know, I, I think you know people should see as a as a really central uh, and really has been since the nineteen fifties. I mean, it's you know it, it's it's one's first stop uh, if one if one wants to become familiarized with uh, resources around Chicago. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, various groups you know uh, within the university and beyond. I mean, if one is looking for uh, you know help and resources and guidance and those kind of things, uh, the AIC is always a good place to start. There are lovely people over there. Um, and we have a question from Danielle Lopez, um, who is a current first year undergraduate student in a college majoring in anthropology and linguistics. Um, they identify as a global indigenous Honduran and Filipina student. Um, and they're interested in establishing an indigenous rights affinity group where they can discuss sort these sorts of issues. 
what sorts of projects or initiatives do you anticipate would help further land acknowledgements efforts, as well as reframing education to include indigenous literature, art, and culture? And maybe you could just elaborate on maybe one of those other uh, like indigenous futures groups or other things happening around Chicago um, that we haven't touched on before. I'm sorry, the question was through literature and was through literature um, and art? Re, um, what sorts of projects or initiatives do you anticipate would help further land acknowledgement efforts, um, as well as reframing Question. education to include indigenous literature, gotcha. art, and culture? Yeah, yeah. I, there's, there's a couple of things that are already happening that I'll, you know, that I'll share that I think are exciting. Uh, uh, one of which is uh, uh, the Ojibwe artist Andrea Carlson has uh, 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 her future downtown, uh, a great big reminder that you are on Potawatomi land. Um, which I think, uh, you know, again, in terms of, I mean, it's a great big land acknowledgement uh, is, is, is what it is, right? Um, and again, as much as it's seemingly simple, right? It's not, it's, you know, it's, it's surprisingly hard to just get, get through those basic uh, concepts. So I think it's a really extraordinarily powerful piece um, uh, uh, for sure. Um, another local artist, um, uh, Santiago X, um, uh, is, uh, has revived the tradition of, of mound building uh, uh, in this region uh, as, as uh, uh, somebody also comes from a mound building tradition in the Southeast. Uh, 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 Santiago is also um, somebody who's indigenous to Guam. Um, and, you know, I know that's part of his, uh, part of his sensibilities about thinking about global indigenous uh, space um, in the sense that part of what Santiago is envisioning is effectively what would a public park look like if native people were able to uh, take ownership of it and, and, uh, and decide to implement everything we wanted to do with it, right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, Sonia works as uh, uh, answer to that is uh, we would uh, uh, not replicate uh, old traditional mounds and, and make uh, and make replicas right but keep the tradition alive in, in new and exciting ways for different kinds of purposes right uh, but but keep the aesthetic keep the tradition alive um, and so you know those are you know uh, uh, some really important uh, uh, projects that have gone on uh, lately um, you know, I mean, our, our local artists have just been fabulously successful in important ways. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Chris Papan has uh, seen his artwork on uh, on, on billboards. Uh, uh, he and Monica Rickard Bolter have had uh, public art moving around the city, uh, educating people. Um, so, I mean, I think the possibilities of public art uh, are really powerful, um, and I think. Uh, that's more powerful than you know, uh, to, than permanent monuments uh, uh, are, uh, which are not especially effective at, at, at sparking conversation, uh, and do not say timely, right? Um, and, and I think there's there's something about public art exhibitions um, and their you know, and their ability to be timely that I think is especially important uh, for for raising these kinds of conversations. Um, and in terms of wider land acknowledgement efforts, um, well, what I would say is. Um, I, I don't love that the uh, Chicago Blackhawks uh, has put a Band-Aid on uh, their own team situation by, by doing a land acknowledgement of their own. Um, I think that's an example of a, uh, of a you know, uh, sort of corporate misuse of, uh, of, of that sort of practice. Um, uh, and, and the reason I, I invoke that team is which is to say, um, I think the Chicago Blackhawks uh, could, could do an awful lot, perhaps more than uh, most organizations in Chicago uh, could initiate conversations about uh, uh, of land acknowledgement and, and whose, whose territory it is uh, that we all occupy here in Chicago, uh, if they were to, you know, uh, uh, open those conversations by changing their own imagery, right? Yeah, you know, your point is well taken that a lot of these gestures can be very empty and performative. Um, before I, before we segue to the other question, I actually, you got me thinking about, um, so at Northwestern, um, you know, obviously there's this, there's an importance of engaging with uh, local communities, local tribes, which has built on longstanding relationships. I know of a particular faculty, indigenous faculty members at um, Northwestern. Um, and then of course, there's this connection to the broader city of Chicago through, um, you know, pu public arts and engagement, you know, uh, partnerships with uh, the Field Museum and um, the Newberry Library. Um, but to circle back to what you were saying about students and in, and building up, I guess, a critical mass of those students, does Northwestern have any sort of um, arrangements for like native students to attend 
Um, I know other universities have that, and perhaps that could be some a model that we are pushing forward um, in the regions. Like, if you want to have more indigenous programs, and we need to bring indigenous students, and then that puts pressure on administration to also invest more in native studies. You know, I'm I'm touting all these exciting things happening all over town, and have forgotten um, UIC. Um, UIC has recently made a really major uh, commitment that uh, anyone who is uh, a member of a federally recognized tribe, whether you're from Alaska or Oregon or uh, or Florida, you can attend UIC uh, as uh, someone who receives in-state tuition, right? So uh, for the purposes of UIC, every Native person is a, is a resident of Illinois. Um, and I think that's just absolutely fantastic. I think that's really an innovative um, uh, uh, sort of engagement. It's the kind of thing I would like to see uh, uh, Northwestern pursue. Um, it's definitely on the list of things uh, that we're pushing for in different form. Uh, for instance, um, we don't have any uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho descendants, um, uh, people who are descendants of the, uh, of the, of the Sand Creek Massacre survivors um, uh, who are attending uh, of the university and, uh, and getting a degree from it. I honestly feel like that's the first uh, uh, kind of uh, repayment that can, you know, that can uh, that can be uh, uh, that can be owed, um, but we still have to we still have to work on creating uh, you know some sort of special basis for getting them uh, to recognize a, a particular need um, uh, for that kind of admissions. And, you know, and I can say this is the kind of stuff we've been talking about over say like last year. Um, not always seeing eye to eye, not always necessarily getting it. You know, sometimes they uh, we we fund all of our students that that need funding, right? Um, no, it's not quite the same thing as you know. Uh, say Dartmouth uh, and its uh, uh, native fly-in program, right? Which is you want to come check out Dartmouth, uh, we'll fly you in, right? Um, you know that's quite a quite a major commitment. Um, yeah, so anyway, rambling a little bit. <laughs> well, that's our aspiration. This is why we have to work together as institutions uh, to be putting pressure on our own institutions yeah, yeah. to be doing more. Um, um, I have a question here now from Brandon. Do you feel like there's a fundamental disconnect with the idea of land acknowledgements, the idea that the land, quote, belongs to someone in a very recent Western invention? Um, he's thinking about the verb steward um, that you see a lot in land acknowledgements and how this might differ from ownership. Yes, that, that's a great point. Uh, you know, and uh, yeah, one, one definitely too. Uh, to emphasize, right? I mean, yeah, I think buried within it, there is, you know, uh, maybe for those who, you know, who, who aren't totally clued into indigenous conceptions of relationships with the land, um, you know, that framework, that language of land acknowledgement uh, could maybe seemingly imply property, right? Seemingly imply uh, ownership and, and, and title, which is uh, not necessarily the point, right? Uh, and the, the point is to actually, uh, 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 to talk about uh, uh, relationships. Um, and you know, and, and again, this is kind of like pointing back to what I said about you know Chicago in particular is a is a particularly tough uh, place to try to do a land acknowledgement because it's uh, uh, because it's very fluid. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that's a that's a that's a perfectly uh, a valid critique to be made of of land acknowledgements, um, uh, uh, one of many. Um, and I think in, in many ways, you know, we can maybe uh, you know sort of tweak our understanding of you know what the purpose of them is in in the sense of. What are often, you know, delivered as scripted land acknowledgments, right? Uh, to me, that that sort of stands in the place of what really should be fuller, substantive, uh, historical reckoning and an acknowledgement, right? Um, and you know, often in short of that, you know, uh, what we get is, you know, uh, is uh, is in many cases, uh, you know, these kinds of scripted uh, statements, right? Um, but yeah, you know, something like a land acknowledgement, what it's doing is, you know, again, why, why it's difficult for Chicago is you're kind of artificially trying to freeze in time. It's like, well, when are you talking about, right? Uh, if you want to do treaties, okay, Potawatomi people, right? If you want to talk about, uh, you know, who was here in the 16th century, well, there were Menominee people and Ho-Chunk people and, you know, uh, really all kinds of people who were passing through, right? Um, and so that becomes a difficult kind of question. There's a great website that uh, maybe some of you have used, um, nativeland.ca. Um, and I think that's that's one of the 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 the, uh, the you know uh, real tricky things about that website. It's an extraordinarily great resource. Um, but as a historian, one thing I find a little bit confusing about it is when are you talking about, <laughs> right? Um, because it's just sort of like this is where uh, that particular group of people lives, right? Uh, and always has and always will, right? Uh, and it's you know uh, sometimes you know more complicated than that, and we're not necessarily able to capture what are much more fluid uh, histories. You raise an ex excellent point about temporality, which has always been an issue about 
writing and representing Indigenous history, right, um, is the conflation of, okay, this was all in the past. Um, and so this is why increasingly I'm, I'm talking about um, like a statement of relation, which makes it a, an active verb as opposed to something passive. Um, so it's like, like this whole who's who used to occupy these lands. I swear to God, yeah. <laughs> it's a pet peeve of mine. Right? <laughs> yeah, because again, it, it entirely goes to like patterns of settlement. It's like, well, you're you're no longer right there, so no longer it no longer means anything to you, right? As opposed to an ongoing and even into the future this is the ancestral homelands of, right? And that's always going to be true, right? That was, you know, that was true hundreds of years ago, perhaps a thousand years ago, depending on what group you're talking about, right? But well into the future, still remains true. It's ancestral homeland. It's special for always, right? Regardless of whether one is still inhabiting it, right? And it also moves away from, I guess, well, these moves to innocence, if you just talk about the past, then that means no one is responsible anymore. It's like, oh, well, that was my ancestors. That was an unfortunate thing that happened. This land was lost, but now we're here now um, versus to be using something um, presently, you know, like, well, what is our responsibility now to this land, to um, communities that are still here? And then that becomes a much more complicated question. And that's with these examples that you brought up, I think are excellent with like the village of Hobart, right? Like, what does it mean when indigenous people actually assert themselves and they get back land lawfully? <laughs> like they buy back land using like American land tenure system and people are pissed off that they actually are buying back their land or to show, oh, look at, you know, we, um, you know, we have a, a presence on campus. So it's the enduring presence is what makes it um, difficult for people to grapple with. The past, I think people can, <laughs> they're just now being able to accept, oh yes, these are ancestral homelands, but um, right. reckoning with it in the present is a, is a whole nother issue. I think for many, it's kind of an exercise of pointing to a, a you know, spot on the map and saying bad things happened here, right? Um, okay, which is a start, right? Um, you know, but the bad things becomes the motive for <laughs> why are you talking about, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, what is it that you're seeking to acknowledge, right? And as you talk about relationships, ongoing kind of practices, right? Um, I, I think that's really the kind of more important thing in the sense of what does that imply about responsibility, right? Not just a long time ago, bad things happened here and it means nothing to us today, right? Uh, well, no, that's not true, right? Uh, really engage it, right? And really uh, not just, you know, again, uh, do the bare minimum and acknowledge, you know, that history happened, um, but to, you know, bear some sort of responsibility to it, relationship to it at least, right? As opposed to, we will acknowledge history happened. Now it's just fodder for like American horror films and Indian graveyards. So <laughs> anyway, that's a whole nother thing. <laughs> um, Get me started. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, SJ actually has a, a question for you. So I'll turn it over to them. Hi, thank you Doug for that presentation and this conversation has been so rich. Um, kind of just jumping back to where you began, um, and Teresa just mentioned it, but the sort of undoing of allotment and the success of the Oneida Nation and getting land back. I was curious um, about any lessons or takeaways from your experience of and writing of that um, ongoing fight. Uh, did, do you find any connections or resonances with the work and organizing at Northwestern? and? And some of the, the approaches that have been taken there, um, or do they feel to like very distinct um, approaches and fights? No, they they definitely do. I mean, you know, what, what most of all made it feel related to me was um, was the uh, vandalism when the when the students were uh, putting up their Happy Native American Heritage Month. Uh, it really, to me, in, the, in that moment, I felt like, well, this feels like Hobart. Um, this just feels like, you know, uh, you know somebody just wanted to, to rain in our parade. And to give you a bit of sense of like what I mean by that, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the most recent uh, 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 lawsuit, uh, which I think is uh, at last, finally, the, the, the very last one. Um, so we'll have an ongoing bad relationship, right? Uh, an ongoing, uh, uh, not, not necessarily being okay with one another, uh, but I think the dispute is over. Uh, the reservation is real and its boundaries are there. Um, and the federal court has weighed in and said that's that's the case. Um, but in terms of like this kind of raining on the parade, like really, why are you gonna do this? Um, in, in a moment of celebration, um, the uh, the case that I worked on um, uh, in, in regards to the disputes with the village of Hobart uh, was about an uh, event called Big Apple Fest. And 
this is a autumn harvest festival for the community. Uh, families across the reservation, non-native people all across Green Bay too, uh, you know, welcome to come into the community for hay rides and apple picking and going and seeing the historic uh, Oneida cabins and all this kind of stuff. And Apple Fest became the basis of why we got sued. Um, Oneida Nation can't be blocking traffic uh, on highways. Uh, you know, that uh, Just because it owns property here, XYZ, it's not legally technically held in trust yet. And so that still makes it under our jurisdiction as land that is just private property held by them that the federal government hasn't formally transferred, right? And it was just really the lowest, right? Um, you know, at, at different points, you know, it, it, you know it, it's just, you know, uh, you know, something as simple as, you know, a community gathering. Uh, and and, and the, the, the issue was, the argument was based on the idea that uh, Oneida Nation wouldn't be able to adequately uh, uh, assure public safety at that event. We do have our own tribal police department. I think it's actually more well-resourced than the neighboring village of Hobart, uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, because uh, the Oneida Nation uh, is uh, you know, quite well-resourced because the casino these days. Um, and so, I mean, it really you know, flatly was a racist proposition that somehow Oneida people can't maintain order uh, uh, with blocking the roads, uh, despite the presence of all, you know, all of the requisite uh, public safety uh, institutions. Um, but it was just a, on a technicality. You, you don't have that land back in federal trust yet, and until you do, that's still ours. And that was the, that was the basis of the legal question, uh, because they were trying to make the point, until it's actually in for real federal trust, you have zero say over it. None. It's ours. And the federal court said, no, that's not the way that works. <laughs> it's still inside the reservation. Even if you own it, even if you have the title, it's still inside their reservation, right? Just as the Congress can designate the boundaries of what the state of Wisconsin is, and somebody can buy up all land inside of that and change the land ownership composition, that does not not make it Wisconsin, right? It's still Wisconsin. Congress designated the boundaries by treaty. That's what they are. Nothing aside from Congress revisiting them to say that they're no longer there implicitly gets rid of them. They're still there. Um, and so that was the that was the where they found an opportunity. Uh, Applefest, they wanted to shut it down. Thank you so much for that example, Doug. Um, well, I, I guess we're now coming to the end of our, our time. There's one more final question and perhaps um, I'm already thinking this could be a way to talk about the Field Museum exhibit we're both working on, but this has to do with education and pedagogy. Um, Astrid asks, um, I'm wondering how Doug might suggest talking with young kids living in Chicago or anywhere in North America about this past. I'm specifically thinking about past harm and trauma and ways to portray that in an empowering way for indigenous people and also in a way children can understand and learn from. In other words, how would you explain a land acknowledgement to children or has, um, or have you, Doug, seen this done in say an elementary school uh, setting in a positive way? Uh, that's a good question about, um, I, I thought i uh, seen it done in an elementary school setting. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, locally, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, Evanston Township High School. Uh, they, they probably likely perhaps have one. Um, but that's a really good question in terms of um, uh, pedagogy, in terms of the local landscape too, particularly because it does connect to the Field Museum in the sense of, um, yeah, I think one of the most important things that the Field Museum exhibition can do, and I brought this up in recent meetings about, uh, we're going to have this beautiful new exhibition that's going to uh, stay updated and uh, you know, uh, in perpetuity, uh, what are some of its functions? Like, who are we trying to reach with it? And as far as I was concerned, top of the list uh, was the Chicago public school system. That's just to say, um, for all this question of, right, um, you can ask people to teach about indigenous issues, right? And in Wisconsin, there's there's a law for a whole bunch of reasons I won't get into um, uh, uh, in the late 1980s, spearfishing rights. Um, but there's a law that, uh, you know, that requires teaching American Indian history and culture um, at certain grades, um, you know, through the K-12 system. That does require, though, people being adequately prepared to actually do that instruction, right? Um, and I, it is, you know, uh, while even being kind, it is it's perfectly possible for people to do more harm than good if they're not particularly ex expert in teaching uh, Indigenous issues, right? And for many people, it's not something uh, that they have a lot of prior knowledge about, right? Um, and so there's not a lot of... Uh, um, they're kind of on their own in certain cases, right? So in Wisconsin, there's a summer institute to try to you know, develop people's capacity to teach, right? And that's one solution to it. But that's to say, asking people to 
cover the content, right, is is a great idea. But on the other side of that, there's also the practicality of are they going to be able to capably teach certain kinds of content? That's what I think is really exciting about the field museum. As much as you know, there's there's a lot to be said about the, the legacies of you know uh, you know exhibiting native people in the in the old dinosaur museums. Um, but still, it has an important civic function, and that all of the students from the Chicago public school system have access to what is a state-of-the-art exhibition about Native North America with a really good focus on Chicago in particular, right? So as far as I'm concerned, best thing one could do for now, uh, uh, you know, short of having to provide actual resource to, you know, to show our people's capacities to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to take this uh, material into the classroom, this is one use for the museum. You know, that can become a field trip. And they can learn from elders themselves uh, through uh, through the media, you know, for example. Oh, I couldn't agree um, with you more, Doug. <laughs> I get that question a lot too. And I'm like, the Field Museum, uh, I mean, I always jokingly say, oh, probably more children and visitors will uh, see the, the text labels that we've written and um, go through yes. rather yes. than reading any of my journal articles. So yes. <laughs> your public yes. education. That is completely true. Uh, also, I'll, I'll, I'll say another uh, book promo. I'm writing an introduction for um, what is, I think of one of only two I can think of, um, Native American history books uh, for a, a young adult audience. Um, local uh, musician, Liam McDonald um, uh, uh, in Chicago is, is writing a, uh, for Penguin, uh, an overview of Native American history for, for young readers. Um, and you know, I, I think, that's to say that like, literally this is the second book <laughs> that I've ever seen. Uh, there's a, a children's edition of uh, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's uh, An Indigenous People's History of the United States. Um, and you know, so there's a version of that for young readers. And I, before uh, hearing about Liam's book uh, that's worth coming uh, in the fall, um, I don't know of uh, many others. Uh, well, they actually, our own Patty Lowe at uh, Northwestern, I shouldn't forget, uh, her book through Wisconsin Historical Society Press um, you know, also comes in a young reader's edition. Uh, and actually, I've seen that book in wide publication um, uh, throughout Wisconsin. Um, you know, I, I've seen it in, you know, in, in the hands of uh, friends' children. So it's, it's really found its way around. Um, so that's one state-focused model uh, for you know, local, uh, you know, thinking about um, <clears throat> adequately covering the indigenous nations of Wisconsin in that case. Um, so there's a few examples, but you know, not a ton. And so I think, you know, literature geared toward uh, uh, young adult readers is really important, and and museums. Yeah, uh, you know, I think most of us, if we think about our favorite museums, uh, memories of museums, right, they're all in childhood. Um, and so I think it's really important, uh, uh, you know, that the uh, exhibit find a way to connect with kids. And that's been something we've been talking about really through the through the whole process, mm -hmm. being mindful that that's a lot of who comes through there. I just put the uh, um, Roxanne Dunbar thesis book, and this is the adult version. Um, Great, oh, normal people, not adult, as in <laughs> inappropriate content. Adult. Um, I don't. I don't know if there's a link there for the um, teen, um, young adult version. Um, and I'm also going to put one other book on here. Um, I haven't yet read it, but um, it recently came out. Notable Native People, which is. Um, it highlights different indigenous folks. And this is, I think, more towards a young audience. And that's by Adrian Keene, um, um, who's faculty at Brown. So there's a couple of texts that I'll throw in there. Um, but with that, um, Doug, thank you so much. This has been such an enlightening conversation. Um, there's so much more to learn, uh, but thank you so much for joining us virtually here today. Thank you all for inviting me and it's been a real pleasure. Hope to meet you all in person one day. Take care. Come to our exhibit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. May 20th. <laughs>